Okay, I'm going to go through uh, the passages that talk about the church in Philadelphia, starting in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. If you have a reference Bible, you can follow along. I think it would simplify the process for you, but whatever. And uh, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write. Okay, so on the, the map... Uh, for the seven churches, you can see that Sardis, or Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea uh, are in this little valley region, but it's more inland where Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos is more along the coast, okay, and then south of Laodicea is Colossae. So the church in Philadelphia. Now, Philadelphia, okay, Bible name for a place where there was a church located, historically, a church back in the day of Paul and John, uh, doctrinally seems to typify a time period during the church age uh, involving the Reformation and the producing of the King James Bible and the wonderful revivals that uh, flow out of the King James Bible, and the only nation that uh, really, truly wanted Jesus Christ to be their authority in the United States of America. This, this country has such a wonderful Christian heritage that has been uh, kept secret in the schools. The schools do not teach about the wonderful heritage of this nation. And you can see by the names of the cities here, Philadelphia, okay, where liberty was birthed in this country. And these, uh, you'll find these names of these cities, especially around the southeastern portion of Pennsylvania, you'll find Bethlehem. Ephrata, Lebanon, okay, and you'll find that that's around those regions where they name their towns after uh, cities uh, that are found in the Bible. So this is a church in Philadelphia, and he says, right, uh, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, Okay, we know that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He that hath the key of David. Okay, that was mentioned in Isaiah verse, uh, chapter 22, verse 22, about this key of David. And I'll read this here. And it says, And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open, and none sh shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall shall open. So this key of David, David is, uh, did you, I don't know if you knew this, um, seems to be a good name, uh, but, <clears throat> but David is the name that is used most uh, in the Bible of any name, even including Jesus. And David is a name that's spelled the same in the Old Testament and the New Testament, where you have Noah, with the H in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, you drop the H. Then you have Joshua in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, it's Jesus. Okay, David is a unique name. I think it occurs over a thousand times, but it is the one that I know to be used the most of any name in the Bible. And of course, uh, King David is going to also be a king during the millennial time period where Jesus Christ will be the king of kings and those lower case K kings, one of them will be David himself. And the idea with this is that he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. This is commonly referred to as an open door. In Revelation 3 verse 8, I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door door. Okay, and the idea of that open door is uh, a believer often prays about things and he asks the Lord to open a door for them. And, and that is like a confirmation of the circumstances that God uh, wants you to move forward into that direction. Okay, where in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 9, 
Here's where it's used once, where Paul said, For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. Okay, that would be the door of opportunity uh, to witness, but there's adversaries. Uh, Second uh, Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, reveals another passage about that. Where he says, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Okay, this is an open door of opportunity. This is um, something that a New Testament believer can pray for. We're not told to pray for signs. We're not told to put out fleeces and all this stuff. What I like to do is if I believe, the, you know, if I want to go a certain direction and I want the Lord to, to reveal that this direction is the right way to go, I would ask him to make it a no-brainer where it's almost like, man, that's a no-brainer. And uh, he'll arrange the circumstances where you know the Lord has arranged these circumstances. Now, we need to remember, too, that the devil hears our prayers and sometimes... He can arrange circumstances where he makes it look like it's uh, right. And so, again, you got to continue to pray that the Lord makes it obvious. Okay, so this idea of an opened door uh, is an open door of opportunity to make known the truths of God. Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, With all praying also for us, that God would open Unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. So that's an open opportunity to preach the gospel, okay, in a given area. You can see that. Uh, certain, uh, you know, tyrants and, you know, in certain states, mostly on the Democratic side, the Democrat side, Democrats or whatever. Okay, they're little tyrants where they, they, they feel it's essential to go to the bar or the casinos, but not to church. Okay, and fortunately... Uh, some church folks uh, have uh, won in court against these little tyrants. Okay, but if you look at the history of our nation and the colonists who came over, and if you understand the real history of our nation, what a marvelous heritage we have. I might, I might go through a little series on the heritage of this nation. Uh, there's a fellow named David Barton that you find him online that he has given a lot of these original documents and shows uh, that Christianity was very, very strongly influencing this country. And even the Supreme Court's opinion on two or three cases has admitted that, that this is a Christian nation. Now, obviously, we know America is filled with a bunch of heathen, a bunch of pagans, a bunch of apostate Christians now. But the, the root documents, the founding documents, and the colonists were having, experiencing great revivals. And so Christianity amongst the common people was very, very instrumental in this country. And we have such a wonderful heritage. And that's why it's being attacked so much by the devil. At the same time, with uh, this country coming through with Christianity amongst the uh, common people, the elitists, the hidden secret, the Rothschilds, uh, developed the Illuminati. So in America, you have Satanism and Christianity going side by side. Now, for my earned doctorate, I, had, I wrote a thesis about faith and freedom. It's supposed to be 100 pages. Uh, it ended up being a 300-page book about the faith and freedom in this country. Now, you could also, at the same time, write about the conspiracy of Satanism throughout America at the same time, because they came side by side, just like Jesus prophesied in the parable of the so uh, in the parable of the tares and the wheat, where the Lord lets them grow together until his coming. 
So in Revelation 3, verse 8, it's, it's an idea that's given of an open door. And in America, when in the early days, when evangelists came into town, like George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards, and then later on, D.L. Moody, entire cities, towns, communities would come to Christ. Uh, today, you'll have people coming in, you know, evangelists coming in, you know, and, and nothing changes. Not a thing changes. And that's because America had an open door of opportunity, and there was only one Bible that was being preached from the pulpits in this country in the early 1700s and the 1800s, clear up into the early 1900s, even up to the last great national evangelist of this country, Billy Sunday. No, it wasn't Billy Graham. Is Billy Sunday. It was the King James Bible that was being preached, and thousands of people were coming to Christ as a result of that open door of the Spirit using the King James Bible to bring uh, these folks to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in Revelation 3.8, he says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an opened door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. So in the church history, this would probably be anywhere from the Reformation <coughs> to the early 1900s. In the, late 18th, uh, in, the, in the late 17th century, the late 1800s, there were very many uh, subtle satanic things that began during those times. That's when Jehovah Witness began. That's when Mormons began. That's when the Civil War, or the Uncivil War uh, took place. That's when uh, the first uh, revision came out, the revised version in 1880. A lot of deceptive, very deceptive things took place from 1850 to 1890. And so you have in Revelation 3, 9, behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. Okay, so whenever there's a great revival, Satan usually infiltrates Okay, and then he will subtly begin to get his uh, program going during these revivals to start dispelling or confusing these new believers in Christ. So this Revelation 3, 9, where he says, I will make of them the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Now that idea about fake Jews was mentioned in chapter 2, verse 9. People saying that they are Jews and are not. You'll see that in 2, verse 9. So here it is the second time that that's mentioned. And that will show that the nation of Israel today is infiltrated with fake Jews, secular Jews, uh, you have the Kabbalah, you have Ashkenazis and Khazars, you have natural-born Jews who may be sincerely following Judaism, you have atheistic Jews. I mean, you have such a conglomerate of people that refer to themselves as Jews. In this context, they're talking about fake Jews. The fake Jews would be the ones funding the fake news and the fake Jewish or the fake Bibles, okay, and the fiat currency, the fiat money uh, throughout the world, the international banking cartels. That would be the fake Jews of Revelation 3, 9, and they're of the synagogue of Satan. That's not the Jewish remnant the Jewish remnant who will inherit the Abrahamic promises and the land grant will be restored to their kingdom during the millennial time period. The Lord has not forsaken Israel. Yes, but in Israel, there are some who will say they're Israel and not of Israel. That's what Paul said in Romans 9 verse 6. 
But you see, the Lord is not done with them. The Lord has not replaced Israel with the church. I mean, if you're in that camp, you are in a pretty heavy camp of deception. And so you de- it's rare once you get in, in, in uh, camping in that campground, it's not too many come out of that campground because of conceit and self-righteousness. So Revelation 3.9 warns of fake Jews. And then he says this, Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Who is he loved? The ones who keep his words, who believe his words. Verse 10, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now again, as I mentioned, these churches will will have a uh, you know, a flavor for New Testament Christianity, but there's a, there's a undercurrent here of uh, Jewish ideas because James, John, and Peter, according to Galatians 2 verse 9, were uh, apostles to the circumcision. So they will continue this Jewish flavor from Hebrews to the end of the Bible. And if there's some church age doctrine filtered in there that agrees with Paul's writings, then we can accept those uh, truths of God. Now, in verse 11, he, he gives something very important where he says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast that thou hast that no man take thy crown. There are crowns that are written throughout the New Testament that will be offered for either the born-again believer and the Jewish righteous of the tribulation, and a person's in danger of losing that crown. Okay, just like in sports, if you get crowned a champion, man, you have a bullseye on you, and and all the rest of the teams are going to try to knock you off that hill. And so you're in danger of losing that crown. Now, one place that mentions that idea is found in 2 John. So again, uh, a lot of Jewish flavor going on here. In 2 John verse 8, because there's no chapter here, you'll see in verse 7 the word Antichrist is mentioned. Antichrist was first introduced by John in 1 John 2.18. So that's why this is mentioned, because that's the time period he's dealing with. And then it says this in verse 8, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. There's an opportunity, uh, spiritually speaking, for the born-again believer to lose some of their rewards, depending upon your associations. And in verse 9, he said, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. So this, unfortunately, this is where uh, evangelist Billy Graham dropped the ball. Sure, we're excited that many people got saved through his ministry. But unfortunately, because he kowtowed with liberals... Uh, people who denied the Bible, even with uh, feline fanatics, the head feline fanatic in the Vatican, when he kowtows and gives, bids these people Godspeed, these false believers and uh, liberals, heretics, uh, Godspeed, God's blessing, uh, he forfeited many of the awards, rewards that he could have received because of giving aid and comfort to liberals. And this is what John is warning about. In verse 12 of chapter 3, he said, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Now, again, there is another evidence of the Jewish flavor. He didn't say in the church. He said the temple. The pillar of the temple. What temple? The millennial temple of Ezekiel 40 to 48. 
And he shall go out no more out, and I will write upon his name the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. Now that it will be New Jerusalem, when we get to Revelation 21, we'll discover that will be the permanent abode for the church, because it's like a bride, <clears throat> which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. And then 13, again, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Uh, uh, the Lord closed out each of these memos to these individual churches with, hey, hey, you need to rely upon the Holy Ghost, the author of the Bible, the author of the truth of the Word of God, the Scriptures, the author and the interpreter and the teacher, rely upon the Holy Ghost to guide you into all truth. Okay, so that is uh, going through the church in Philadelphia. <laughs>